this month marks the eight-year anniversary of the end of the Great Recession. That's right, June 2009 was the official end date, but of course high unemployment and lackluster growth persisted for years after that date. Eight years later, just as things are starting to get better and the Federal Reserve feels comfortable enough to take its foot off the accelerator, are we close to the next recession? Over the next hour, we are joined by an incredible panel of market pros. Let's introduce you to everyone. Peter Shear is a fixed income expert and managing director at Breen Capital. He's also heading up the street's new fixed income product, Income Seeker. Douglas Borthwick is the head of foreign exchange at Chapdelaine. And Stephen Starge Guilfoyle is a market expert and former NYSE trader. David Yo Williams is a commodities and gold expert and principal at Strategic Gold. And guys, welcome to all of you. It's good to see everyone. I want to start off with the folks who think that a recession is going to come sooner rather than later. Peter, that's you, as you wrote in your column on thestreet.com. How bad will the next recession be and when will it come? I don't think it's going to be a deep recession. I think it'll be fairly shallow and fairly short, but I think it's coming sooner rather than later. I think you're starting to see it in some of the economic data. You see the City Economic Surprise Index. That's fallen precipitously lately. And you talk to people, you're out there in the real economy, you're starting to see auto slow down, business travel slow down. There was a lot of you know, excitement about the new you know, DC and everything that was going to be delivered. And as that gets delayed, I think you're going to see a pullback. Okay, so you said soon. Can you put a time stamp on that? It was six months, one year, two years? You know, we may well already be in the early stages of that type of recession. If you go back even to 2007 and 8, we were in a recession before anything was called. So I think we're in that slow down kind of now or very, very shortly. Hmm. All right. And, and David, your Williams, I mean, you also in your column uh, were a little bit sounding the alarm. What do you think? I, I, uh, I agree with Peter, but I'm, I'm more on the fringe. I, I think that we're not going to have a mild recession. I, I actually think that we're going to have a very um, uh, deep recession once it, once it occurs. Uh, I think that uh, since 1987, actually, that the Fed and Fed intervention has been, and been going on uh, to uh, lessen the effects of any kind of recession that we've had. And I think that, that cumulatively, that is going to catch up to us. And when it does, it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be extremely serious. Uh, and PIMCO actually sees a 70% chance of a recession by 2022. Do you agree with that? Oh, yeah. 2022, we're, out in, we're, out in, we're in Doug Worthing. I, I think I'm, I'm far more in the camp that says it's going to be uh, fairly soon, uh, certainly within, I think, within a year, but I think maybe before uh, year's end, maybe before 2018, we're going to start seeing some, some very serious um, uh, signs of, of uh, pullback and recession. But Doug, you would disagree with uh, David and PIMCO. You see recession coming a little bit later, 2024. Well, I think that, think of recessions or growth or GDP as being you know, a concept of uh, volatility. Mm -hmm. And there's very little volatility right now. There's very little volatility because central banks are very, very involved, not just in economies, but also in markets. Who's the biggest buyer of equities these days? Well, some would argue that central banks are big buyers of equities. At the same time, central banks are a big buyer of fixed income. When that's the case and central banks are really running the market economy, it's very hard for you to see the big swings we saw either in GDP to the upside or to the downside. So I think that for us to really see movement in the economy in terms of large negatives or big positives, you really have to wait until the Federal Reserve's balance sheet has rolled off. Mm. And I think that's maybe seven years down the road. Maybe in the meantime, you get very slight recessions, down 0.1 here or there. But the reality is you're not going to see the, the huge down 3% or the up 4% for quite some time, at least until volatility picks up, which will only pick up when Fed balance sheet or ECB balance sheet or BOJ balance sheets are significantly diminished. And that's not going to happen for about seven years. And we're going to talk a lot about the balance sheets in a moment. But first, I want to get to Sarge. I mean, to this point of, you know, potentially waning central bank intervention. I mean, what does that mean? Well, let's start at the beginning. Peter mentioned the city economic surprise. That's 100% right. Uh, since, since May 1st, we've seen about 30 economic data points, including important ones like inflation, retail sales, employment, payrolls, uh, participation, all disappoint, either come in negative or actually disappoint. So there's no doubt the economy is slowing somewhat. As we move forward past this June rate hike that we expect, the Fed is going to be put in a position where some of them might not be so loyal to the tra trajectory they've been putting forth. They might actually, you might see Fed meetings where some people are hawkish and some people are dovish, not the mm. United stand that we've seen for so long. When you get that, we'll get your volatility. Mm. That's when things will get a little dicey here in the U.S. That's when markets will start fluctuating, and that's when we'll see 
just how secure we are up or down three or four percent. But this point that central banks are driving the markets, I mean, Sarge, when you look at stocks like NVIDIA, Walmart, Apple, Take-Two Interactive, I mean, would you attribute those gains to central banks? No, it's really these companies that are driving the markets. No, I, I, earnings were, earnings have been sharp now for, they've been improving for three quarters. The last quarter was very good. The second quarter is estimated up another 10 percent year over year. So, mm -hmm. yes, earnings drive stock price. So, we do have stronger stock prices, although valuations are higher than they probably should be, there is some fundamental basis for it. It's not like these firms aren't making money. Mm. It's not like, like healthcare firms and, and the discretionaries and, and, the, mm. um, and the staples aren't doing better. Mm. These firms, to a large degree, let's leave the retail guys out of it, but they are doing better. So there, there is a fundamental basis, but there is no doubt that as long as the Fed is reinvesting in the balance sheet, well, then they really can't go too far. So for now, although a recession is not a far-fetched dream, we can wander into recession within a year. Mm. It wouldn't blow my mind. But how much of a hit would, would equities take if that happened? They might not take that as severe a hit as you would think. Well, and, and Peter, do you think the markets are kind of distorted, right? We have all these asset classes moving in the same direction, up, right? Bonds, stocks, gold, Bitcoin. Well, I mean, what's your take here? I kind of view the market right now as kind of being supported by a three-legged stool. You've got, you know, FANG or more broadly tech being very, very supportive. And you saw, you know, just yesterday when the FANG stock sold off near the end of the day, there was a, you know, Twitter blew up. There was a lot of concern about that. So I think that's one leg of support. The other leg of support has been the fact that bonds and equities have been behaving very nicely. So on days equities are up, bonds are off a little bit. On the days equities goes down, bonds are rallying strongly. So a lot of people are able to manage their portfolio and you've seen VIX very sedated and you know, we've been under 10 a lot. That to me has been the other leg in this perception of liquidity. So there's this perception that you can sell what you want when you need. Maybe it's partly driven by the ETFs. Maybe it's because there's this liquidity. I think any one of those legs could be tested where you start seeing, I think the worst case scenario for U.S. markets right now is yields start pushing higher, dragging stocks lower, pushing VIX higher, and then you can get into a bit of a you know, vicious cycle where those lead to a reasonably quick and painful sell-off. But what do you guys make of the 10-year, which is now, what, 2-1, which is actually lower than where it was in uh, November 2008. I mean, isn't that worrisome in itself? To me, this has really been a part, I think, you know, there's a risk parity strategy. You know, Bridgewater's famous for it, developed in, you know, late 80s. And people are saying, I think, buying VIX has not worked. Hedging with options has not worked. The one thing that has worked is you own equities, you own long-dated bonds, and that's worked very well since Brexit. It was extremely, you know, that caught a lot of attention post-Brexit. It caught more attention post-Trump. You saw Putnam lost, launch some funds. You've seen some inflows into other funds. People are gathering towards this risk parity, which in its simplest form is buy equities, buy bonds. So I think that's why both have been going up in tandem, and I think that's why that risk to that cycle breaking could be very ugly. Okay, but can this cycle completely be disrupted by the balance sheet? You guys were talking about the Fed's balance sheet before. Uh, David, what do you think? I, I think it absolutely can. I, I think it goes to the question of, Doug and I were talking about earlier, uh, it goes to the question of the trust in the in the Fed and trust in the in the actual in the system itself. So since at least since Alan Greenspan, the Fed has been on a pedestal. Now it's it's starting to come off its pedestal a little bit in the last let's say six, six to eight months. But the Fed has been on a pedestal where everyone basically watches the Fed and whatever the Fed does, you, you follow because that's where you're going to make money. So that goes to Peter's point that says, okay, equities have been going up, bonds have been going up. That's because basically. The Fed is putting that is is not just our Fed, but the ECB, the Bank of Japan. They are flooding the system with money, and those monies are going into risk assets, and those assets are, are evaluating in price, so are going up in price. If that's the case, at some point in time, that cycle can be broken. I don't. I am of the belief that when it ha it it doesn't happen until it happens. So to try to predict when it's going to happen or something is is kind of a fool's game. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't start to prepare because obviously 8 months into a expansion is a is a very long time historically. And then if you go eight back years. 8 years, if you go back even further than that and go into what actually happened in the last couple of recessions and how they were stopped through Fed intervention, it's 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 incredible how the system hasn't in, in a in a in the system we we live in under the capitalist system, it hasn't been able to 
reinvigorate itself, rejuvenate itself. It's just the 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 bottom points have been have been the the uh, bottom points have been stabilized by the Fed, and then we've moved forward from there. At some point in time, if the if the Fed loses control or if central banks lose control, that's over with, and it's Katie bar the door. You don't know where those levels are anymore. And I, as as being in equities for years and years. Um, I, I just think it, it's the overbought, overvalued syndrome is, is incredible right now, and the risk, the risk is so um, uh, overlooked. Mm. In, and since 19, since 19, since the 2008 recession, 93 percent of of uh, risk assets, equities, have been fueled by the Fed by Fed by Fed monies coming mm. in. So if if that's the case, it goes to Doug's point. This is okay. How do you take that off the bat? How does that come off? How does that debt come off in general? It's not just Fed debt, but it's it's debt in general. And if, if it's just slowly downgraded over seven or eight years, that could be a that's a I think that's a Goldilocks scenario. I think that's fantastic. But I don't necessarily ascribe to the view that that's what's going to happen. Well, let me ask this though, because the <clears throat> Fed's balance sheet is at four and a half trillion dollars. So let's say we go down to three trillion. Is it's that in, is that an accurate? Four and a half trillion dollars is. Think about that. That's incomprehensible. How much is four and a half trillion right. dollars? So if we go to That's, three trillion, we're still going to have 10, 11, 12 trillion dollars on global central banks balance sheet across the world. Isn't that supportive for equity? And you're going to tighten monetary policy away from that too, right? If you listen to John Williams and these other guys, mm -hmm. I mean, not only are they going to manage the balance sheet, they, are they going to cut it in half, but they're going to take the Fed funds rate up another point, point and a half. Right. But right. And any, so, any shrinking so. of the balance sheet by 30%, is equivalent to raising rates by a certain amount as well. Mm. So it, you know, one sort of moves with the other. If you look at this, uh, you know, the stock market versus the balance, the Fed's balance sheet. We've all looked at that yes. chart before, and you say, well, I wonder where the money's coming from. <laughs> well, that's right. it. So if you take some of that money out, well, then what you'll see is you'll probably see volatility go up by thirty percent because mm. now the balance sheet's been decreased by thirty percent. Mm. I, you know, I, I think that, but you have to as we reduce the balance sheet, volatility is going to move up and down. We we'll see. You know, maybe higher highs, but or maybe lower lows, but certainly you'll get the volatility back in the market that right now doesn't exist. Because you may feel like you're in a free market because you see much better earnings in this stock or that stock. But I think that the reality is when central banks own 30% of all outstanding government fixed income, it's not really a free market anymore, is it? Well, but Doug, for the dollar, though, I mean, there's worry, though, that raising interest rates and shrinking the balance sheet is kind of a one-two punch for the dollar uh, in, terms no. of, in terms of upward in terms pressure. Of, in terms of strength for the dollar, yeah, sure. Yeah, in terms of upward but pressure. But I think what, what you're seeing is that the Fed certainly has gone out, or not the Fed, but the U.S. government right now, and Trump you know, for sure has gone out and said, look, we want a weaker dollar. Mm. The way we make the U.S. more competitive is having a weaker dollar. Now, that's a different mantra from what you're hearing elsewhere, where most folks come out and say, oh, the dollar's weakening because nobody likes Trump. I think that that's mm. completely incorrect. From day one, he's talked about making the U.S. more competitive. We've sat here and said, look, the you know, U.S. wants to have them more competitive. They have to weaken the dollar. Sure enough, the dollar's gone from 104 against the euro up to 112.70 as we're sitting here. You know, the dollar is moving in the direction that Trump wants. So he doesn't look at this and think, oh, goodness me, the dollar's weakening. This is terrible. He's thinking this is great because it's great for America. It's mm. great for competitiveness. The ECB is giving them a hand, too, here. I mean, they're talking about they tightening monetary policy at the same time. So... That's a gift. Why wouldn't you take it? Why wouldn't you take a cheaper dollar? Yeah, what are you expecting from the ECB's meeting on Thursday? I don't think they're going to do anything mm. just yet. I think you give them a few months. If their economy stays on the path where it can walk on both, on both legs, well, they're probably going to knock down QE a little bit. They maybe take it down from $60 billion down to $40 billion, maybe, maybe $10 billion a month, something like we did here in the U.S. They do need to start to get the ball rolling in this, in this area. I mean, they've, they've been far more aggressive than, than has the Fed, at least of late. I'm sure they attribute the recent success in their economy to that, but like we saw here, the success is much smaller than, than the push into extraordinary measure. Mm -hmm. so, David? So why wouldn't, I'm going to the question of why wouldn't you let want a weaker dollar? I, I'm not necessarily disputing that they want a weaker dollar, but why wouldn't you want a weaker dollar? Because then our dollars don't buy as much. So, mm. so from, as a citizen, when I pull 10 bucks out of my pocket, I don't want to buy nine dollars worth of goods and services i want to buy ten dollars worth of goods and services so when you go down that path to start weakening it that that's a that is a that is a slippery slope you you can lose control very very quickly and i think the fed has been in tremendous they've had tremendous control and that last 
month we talked about hubris. I think they have they have gained a hubris that is that is incredible, and I just I, I'm of the opinion me, that it's about me, yeah. So yeah, yeah, respond that to that. Yeah, well, let's look at Middle America. Okay, Middle America would love to have that ten dollars in his pocket and get the nine, but to get Middle America working again, he needs to know, understand right. that he can that that on the world he's not you know thirty percent more expensive as an employee for multilateral corporations, multinational corporations. So in order to make him available and cheap enough for him to be able to be employed so he can then start paying taxes into the U.S. and also then have his $10 to go on vacation somewhere, he needs to have a job. And to get mm -hmm. that job, we have to make America cheaper as a place for people to set up plants and then produce things. And you can't have that as the dollar strengthens every year by 10% because he becomes more expensive by 10%. You have to have it weakened. There's, there's no surprise that every country in the world goes out there to try to weaken their currency, except for the U.S. Right. So we set up a trade thing with, with Mexico like NAFTA. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe Dollar Mex is trading at 3 to the dollar, and now it's at 12. But Doug, don't you or think 18. that the, the euro is or the the euro is losing is gaining steam against the dollar because the gap in policy between the Fed and the ECB is shrinking? Well, the the gap is obviously shrinking. The yield differential is shrinking. But on top of that, no one's talking about Greece anymore. Mm. And even though nothing, we'll all agree, nothing's really changed in Europe. It's not in the radar anymore. On on you know CNBC or on the street every single day where people are talking about Greece, Greece, Greece. What's going on in Italy? People aren't thinking about that now. They're thinking about Trump. Mm. So they're thinking about Trump. And Europe's getting a free pass here, and, they're, and so you see this sort of move up again. No one's buying the euro right now thinking, oh my goodness, what about Greece? Greece is only 2.3% of the overall GDP of all of, of Europe. I don't understand why people ever worried about it. You know, the dollar's not really weak either. I mean, we're talking about 96, 97 right. DXY. Mm. We were talking about an 80 DXY a few years right. ago. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the dollar right. hasn't weakened so. that much. Sure, mm. we've had a little bit of a move, 5 to 8% pretty much across the board against most currencies. But, you know, I expect to see another 10, 15% of weakness mm. before we really start it affecting the U.S., but also a manufacturer won't set up a plant in the U.S. unless he understands that this isn't a short-term phenomenon, but it's something that maybe mm. we, the dollar weakens by 25% from its highs, and then it sits there for a while. Mm. Because, you know, when you open up a manufacturing plant, when you hire workers, you expect to hire them for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. You can't sort of hire them and suddenly become too expensive. Well, you expect, though, to hire them because they're building something or making something people want to buy, and I think that's the concern right now is there's a slowdown in purchasing. Mm. There's a big growth, I think, in terms of experiential. So you're seeing, and whether it's the hotel industry, corporate sales are going down, retailers using hotels more, they're getting more traveling, you're getting China travel. I think the purchase of things continues to decline. I think there's less interest in that. So even if we create this cheaper dollar, I'm not sure that it leads to this great economy where we're building and manufacturing stuff Maybe not a in a world economy, that wants less. But there is somewhere to go. I mean, so, you can go to small caps in a, in a situation like that. You get along mm -hmm. your Russell 2000 names or your yeah. Russell 2000 ETFs. But that's been doing very poorly, which is one of my it, points that concerns that's been me right very here. very poorly, but if there is a belief that we will have a more domestic economy, mm -hmm. those stocks won't do poorly. All right, I want to talk about the euro more in our next segment when we talk about how to recession-proof your portfolio. But one more question on this point about the recession. The unemployment rate is at 4.3%. It was also at this point in 1965, January 1999, and October 2006. After all these times, something bad happens. You know where I'm going with this. The Wall Street Journal had a great article on this. Is there any historical context that is relevant when I talk about those three dates? Absolutely not. Hmm. All right. Different times. <laughs> not just that, but here you have, you have a very low participation rate, not because women are out of the workforce, but because less people are working. Mm. In those, on those other days, except for 2006, well, almost half of our population wasn't looking for a job. Mm. They, they were home either mothering or, or wifing or doing something like that. So, so they weren't part of the statistics. Now the statistics are totally different. The unemployment rate of 4.3% is obviously low. It's not realistic. Gallup has it at 5.5%. The underemployment rate of 8.4% is obviously low. Gallup has it at 13.9%. So you might have been dealing with truer statistics in 1965 than you are now, which paint, it a, which paint a rosier picture than we actually have. So I, I don't think there's much of a well, that's a good point. I mean, David, you, you agree that the I, unemployment I actually, rate is 4.3%? I usually don't agree with Sarge, but <laughs> in this point, I 100% I agree with him that, that I, I don't think uh, the, the employment rate or the unemployment rate has much bearing uh, as far as uh, whether we're going to go into a recession soon or late, sooner or later. I think it has far more to do with, with um, uh, debt, Fed policies, uh, the actual economy itself. Uh, and, I, and I do agree with Sarge. Those statistics are so skewed now. That, uh, and they have been for Plus several those years. Numbers, that, those right. rates are low on the backs of people who are working for nine right. bucks an hour for 29 hours right. a week. 
not for guys or gals making $70,000 a year in an office. So it, it's a different time, and, and the jobs are not as desirable as they once were. Absolutely. All right, I want to move on to our next segment. We talked about the two most pressing questions on this topic. When is the next recession, and how bad will it be? But now let's talk about what you can do to prepare for the eventual recession, because whether it happens in one year, five years, or ten years, you want to be prepared. So, Sarge, I'll go to you on this. Uh, what should you do? How do you recession-proof your portfolio? Well, there's no way to completely proof your portfolio, but you know what? Defense wins championships. Hmm. So if you get the feeling that we might be going into recession, and I, you know what? I, I think it could happen as soon as early next year, hmm. maybe as far as 2020, like 2022, like PIMCO said. Right. I think that's pretty safe that we'll have one by then. But that's when you want to be in your dividend yielding names. That's when you want to be in your utility sector. That's when you want to be in Staples. That's when you want to buy Dave's Gold. And you want to, going to want to be long uh, treasuries at that point. Well, in, you know the, support them. in the PIMCO report I mentioned earlier, they are building up their cash positions so that they have some dry powder during the next recession to get stocks and bonds at a discount. Peter, uh, from a fixed income, uh, income point of view, how do you recession proof your portfolio? I think for now you can continue to own some treasuries or global sovereign debt. I think they're in pretty good shape. I think yields are low, but there's still support. You've got the central banks bu buying them. If we get any sort of hiccup, the central banks will very quickly shift from being hawkish to very dovish, as Doug said. So, and I think you can do some of that. I do think you want to avoid, you know, big global oil plays, big mm. global energy plays, things that are really relying on a robust economy. At the same time, I think you can look for areas that will do well if become very domestic focused. So, you know, pipelines, I continue to think, are an interesting asset here. You get some yield play, you've got, you know, strong support from D.C., and we're going to try and be a little bit more insular, I think, so that works. Mm. I would eye the banks. I'd want to take a look at the banks, but I think the banks probably have another good leg down before they become interesting. Mm. Sarge, do you agree with that? Well, I was shaking my head when you mentioned the banks. The, the, as long as the yield curve stays the way it is, mm. you don't want to be in a bank. I, I sold almost, almost all my bank holdings already this year. I've, mm. I'm just long key banks. I think it's a good stock on valuation. I'm still long some city, but a very small amount. The, the spread between the two-year and the 10-year is now down to, what, 0.84 or something like that? Mm -hmm. I don't want to buy another bank stock until it's even approaching 1%. Mm. So well, until there's a margin in banking, <laughs> I don't play it. So the two things I think to look for, and I think equity guys tend to focus on this, you know, yield curve play. The reality is you got to focus on transaction volume. So mm -hmm. that's why JP and all those guys announced weaknesses. Look at high yield calendar. The high yield calendar slows down. Most the big banks in particular are heavily levered to their FIC businesses. So their fixed income rates and currencies business are what drives it. So when Doug and I are saying, hey, volumes are slow in those areas, that's when the big banks take a hiccup. You also have this lack of volatility impacting mortgage, so there's less mm -hmm. refi. The banks still make certainly the big banks make most of their money on transactions, not from net interest margin. The twos, twenties, you know, I've worked at banks. Banks hedge a lot of their interest rate risk. Banks hmm. blew up in the SNL crisis, and everyone kind of remembers that and says, oh, twos, tens. Stocks correlate with that fairly often because so many people look at it. That tends to be you know, when you want the opportunity. So I wanted out of banks, you know, a month and a half ago. I still want to be out, but I will watch for a turnaround where you start getting credit spreads wider again where you can pick up, or you get some volatility back in the market which will typically happen during recession, that's when I'd want to buy the bank. But we Peter, kind of agree. Yeah. Well, but what do, you, <laughs> what do you make, though, of the fact that financial stocks in the S&P 500 have given up almost all their gains so far this year? I think they were way overdone because we weren't getting the transaction volumes. People also got way too excited about deregulation. I think mm. the whole concept Which hasn't really happened beyond executive orders. Right. And it's probably not going to happen. I think Volcker rule was a silly rule. It was hard to enforce. It mm. decreased liquidity. People don't really understand it. A lot of the other rules are there, they make some sense. Maybe they were over the top a little bit. And you've now had four years of banks trying to implement those rules and adapt to them. I don't think there's going to be a big regulation change or deregulation for banks. So that people got carried away. Small banks, again, I think there's potential. I think small banks will be left a little bit more off the radar screen. Mm. But the big money center banks, they aren't going to get this huge regulatory reform. And I don't even know if they did, if it benefits them that much today or tomorrow. And, and David, when we talk about recession-proofing your portfolio, obviously gold has to be part of it. I, 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 it's, it's our wheelhouse. Mm. The, 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 the truth of it is what, what we've been talking about here with Doug and everything is, like, okay, if, if the dollar is going to get weaker versus the, versus the euro versus versus the Chinese uh, RMB versus uh, the, the yen, if, if all of these things are in play and we're on some sort of a uh, weakening process to try to stay out of recession in different countries, they're all trying to weaken their currencies versus each other. The one thing, the one currency they don't manipulate is gold at this point. Mm. And so if you look at gold as a currency and not as a commodity and huh. say, okay, gold is a currency 
and it's traded like a currency vis-a-vis -vis others, if you look at volumes and stuff, then you say, okay, wait a minute, where do I want to be? I want to be in something that's not controlled by one specific government, by one specific entity. It's it's global, it's worldwide, and so, and and it's also, there, there's, you, you don't have counterparty risk. Gold, mm -hmm. Your gold is your gold. Your counterparty right. risk might be in valuation, but you don't have counterparty risk. You're not going to have the Fed printing do, printing gold. They can't do it. You're not, or, or you know, the ECB taking it away. It's, it's, it's it's a it's a very very different animal and that's why it's a safe haven because in these kind of